on, ladies and gentlemen. So, uh, we proceed to the final part of, of the symposium. And it is a third session, which could be one of the most maybe interesting se uh, sessions as well. And it is security situation in the East Asia. And it is moderated by Dr. Ken Endo, Professor of International Politics and Global Governance, Hokkaido University, Japan. And uh, the rules, time rules are the same. And I, I ask uh, distinguished pan uh, panelists as well to follow the time, time distribution. So please. Okay. So uh, let's get uh, to the straight to the uh, topic as the uh, you know, time, step by step, time has been made to and lunch time is, is approaching. Now, we still have an important topic to discuss, that is the East Asian security situation. So we move further to the East, okay? Now, um, well, you know, well, everything perhaps depends on these sort of things. Uh, in, uh, at least in our view, you know, the EU Japan or that young presidency priorities and so on, you know, are dependent especially on the perceptions on the situation there and, you know, the resulting possibilities uh, or limitations for cooperation. Now, um, I have three things in mind, uh, very briefly. The one, uh, the rise of China. Now, um, you know, um, we have had this uh, things in mind throughout our discussions already uh, over the last two panels, um, and we admit that we have so many security challenges, including you know North Korea, you know terrorism, and so many others. But I think without talking about this very topic. I think it's going to be like a cake without cream and strawberry. Now, um, we have a, you know, in front a sort of nascent giant, by elephant, or whatever you call. You know, the, uh, this is not a normal form of a uh, giant or, you know, uh, elephant. Uh, it spends something like 100 billion US dollars just for the internal security, you know, uh, surveillance and so on. Uh, which is more than, in fact, the defense budget. Uh, can you imagine 100 billion years that per year? Now, this defense budget uh, will reach the level of the United States' defense budget in the year 2033 level. Now, um, it's fine if the, uh, the rise of China is in a peaceful form. But um, we have some doubt, for instance, when the China has never renounced the you know, possible use of force or coercion uh, you know, in what they regard as you know, territorial or internal disputes, name Taiwan, you know, Senkaku, Southeast, you know, South Asian Sea. And uh, uh, you know, uh, there are some concerns. Now, um, related to this, um, we have already talked about the you know, uh, shared values, like-mindedness, uh, you know, democracy and rule of law, uh, same challenge, you know, overlapped interest and supplementary initiatives uh, and functional cooperation and so on. But when we um, you know, um, look at these uh, shared values and like-mindedness, uh, more closely, we are having a sort of different set of intensity, you know, depending on where to project these shared values and so on. Uh, you know, uh, you know, um, perhaps uh, the um, um, uh, Japan might be seen as softer on Russia uh, by Europe. Uh, perhaps Europe uh, softer on China, for instance. Now, how to advance our cooperation? Uh, let's face these sort of dif differences, right? And uh, the, uh, that would be my third set of uh, uh, question. Um, for instance, you know, um, what would be the bottom line? Um, how not to disturb our, you know, sensitivities? Uh, you know, we talk about shared value and how to advance cooperation, but I think it's better to um, discuss 
the, the sort of bottom line um, uh, uh, with which you know we should not disturb our you know uh, uh, vital interest. Now, uh, now from this sort of bottom line, we can go on to discuss much higher you know how to enhance our mutual you know uh, cooperation in a concrete manner. You know uh, what should we do with this sort of uh, declaratory policy? Uh, you know uh, when we form a uh, right joint treaty, preamble of strategic partnership agreement, and so on. Uh, what should we do about the exportation of you know defense related equipment? You know Japan has just. Uh, although limitedly, uh, open uh, our own possibility to export the defense-related equipment and so on. We may have something in common here as well. Um, you know, how should we um, uh, think of the support for democratization? You know, we uh, in the previous session we talked about the sort of approximation of civil societies, which is directly related to the you know sense of threat and so on now uh, should we do something about this um, uh, mutually so these sort of things uh, come to my mind so now uh, i should stop here and uh, let the uh, excellent speakers uh, beside me um, should i follow perhaps the program uh, in order of this uh, you know uh, program uh, first dr yuichi Hose, is it fine this way Right. The uh, almost uh, omnipresent says, you know, in every uh, uh, conference of this kind, a professor of international politics scale. So I think we should, we, should, we don't need any more. Now, second, uh, Mr. Uh, Aiva Torins, uh, director of security policy department uh, and MOFA of this Republic of uh, Latvia, originally I think from the Department of Defense, right? Um, so he he must be a defense expert and then I have a teaching experience as well uh, in the university. Now third, uh, Dr. Uh, Gerhard Sabatio. Again, we probably don't need the, any more introduction. He has spoken out already in the previous session. Uh, Director of Northeast Asia and Pacific uh, EU uh, External Action Service. Now, uh, the, the last speaker, Dr. Zanetta uh, uh, Ozolina, a professor of political science at uh, University of Latvia. Um, and uh, she has been very active also in the society movement as well as the uh, advising to the president and so on. Now, uh, so let uh, the speakers speak. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I will talk about security situation in East Asia because this is a very important topic, I think. Even though East Asia is far away from Europe, uh, but uh, Japan and China. China is the world's second largest economy, or the third after EU, the United States. China is the third biggest economy in the world, and Japan is the fourth biggest economy in the world after well, EU, United States, China. So the third largest and the fourth largest economies. If there will be some war between the two countries, undoubtedly it will affect the uh, global economy, and global peace as well. So that's why uh, the Sino-Japanese relations or East Asia security uh, uh, attract attention of so many people in the world nowadays. And also last year marks 100 years anniversary of the uh, beginning of the First World War. And some scholars, as I will mention a little later, uh, talked about the possibility of the war between Japan and China after 100 year, at the 100 year anniversary of the First World War. But that's why many people are now interested in the future direction of East Asia or future direction of the sino japanese regions. I have only 10 minutes, so I will skip so many slides. And uh, I'd like to start with uh, a uh, 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 saying that there are widespread perhaps misunderstanding about the Sino-Japanese relations. Uh, at the beginning, I want to say that both China and Japan are quite rational countries, which 
uh, really favor peace, which concentrate on economic growth, and which are trying to find out a peaceful way of stability in East Asia. So uh, Japan has been the biggest country to try to help Chinese economic growth. Uh, well, uh, China, uh, Japan is the biggest donor to Chinese, well, ODA, ODA towards China, and still Japan is the biggest investor in Chinese market. So it is undoubtedly true that Japan cannot survive without the growth of Chinese economy. The well, Chinese economy and peace in East Asia are both necessary and vital conditions for Japan, Japanese national interest. So that's why in 2008, there was a very, very important agreement between the two countries, between Japan and China. And in this agreement, a series of agreements in 2008 between Japanese Prime Minister Yasuo Fukuda and the Chinese President Hu Jintao, they actually solved nearly all difficult problems between the two countries. East China border issue and also uh, uh, the common possession of East Asian security order. Let me uh, cite a few words on that. Uh, at the joint statement between the government of Japan and the government of the People's Republic of China, on comprehensive promotion of a mutual beneficial relationship based on common strategic interests, which was agreed in May 7, 2008. It was written that the Chinese side expressed the positive evaluation of Japan's consistent pursuit of the path of peaceful country and Japan's contribution to the peace and the stability of the world through peaceful means over more than 60 years since World War. So it is clear that the Chinese government, government actually officially openly highly evaluated Japan's peaceful path after the 1945. And then uh, at the same month, uh, the two sides agreed on avoiding the escalation of crash in East China Sea. Both sides welcomed the first meeting of the joint working group held in Beijing in late April to establish maritime communication mechanisms between the Defense Authority of Japan and China for the prevention of unforeseen naval accidents. Both sides will endeavor to establish such a mechanism at an early date. So it's clear. And not just that, two sides also agree on uh, the border in East China Sea. The two sides, it is mentioned that the two sides resolved to engage particularly in the foreign areas of cooperation so that Japan and China, which have a major influence on the world economy, can contribute to the sustainable growth of the world economy to work together to make the East China Sea a sea of peace, cooperation and friendship. The two countries called East China Sea as the sea of peace, cooperation, and friendship. So what happened after that? Why we are seeing a crisis in East Asia, East China Sea, and between Japan and China? What happened after that? Of course, after a series of these agreements, Japanese people and also the government of Japan became quite optimistic about the future of Sino-Japanese relations or East Asia. That's why, after these agreements, huge numbers of Japanese companies, leading companies, increased its investment in China. Uh, these companies opened new factories in China, invested more in China. Of course, this helped further Chinese economic growth. But after the agreement, something happened. What happened after that? And interestingly, in just within one year, Prime Minister Fukuda met President Fujintao of, Fujintao of China ten, uh, five times. There were five summit meetings between the two countries just within one year. So at that time, Sino-Japanese relationship was really, really in a good shape. So something happened after that. So how, I have to tell what happened after that. After that, we saw a sort of 
the unilateral China's breach of agreements. China decided to abandon these agreements because of the domestic reasons, domestic politics. Particularly, Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs wanted to stick to these agreements. But two leaders, uh, two President Hu Jintao and particularly Prime Minister Wen Jiaobao, were reportedly heavily criticized by hardliner conservatives within the Chinese Com Communist Party because they argued that China shouldn't have conceded too much to Japan. Japan is already a declining country. China is powerful. And in 2009, we saw the financial crisis. So China became much more uh, proud of its own power, economic military power. They began to think that both the United States and the Japan are declining countries. On the other hand, China is a rising country. So China has to no more concede to Japan on these important issues. These are vital to Chinese national interests. So they should, well, China shouldn't abandon these national interests. So they changed slightly their attitude towards Japan. And December 2008, for the first time in history, never ever before China has violated territorial water of Japan. But China began to violate territorial water of the Senkan Islands for the first time since 2008 December, just uh, six months after these agreements. So it's clear that China began to occupy these islands, not just these islands, but the, the China began to, China would like to control the whole area of the East China Sea, because China then thought that it was possible from a military point of view to fully control the East China Sea. But at the time, uh, Japanese government didn't think it serious because Japanese government still tried to stick to these agreements, tried to protect, defend these agreements. And that's why Japanese protests to Chinese more assertive activity were not so serious. And I, I, I shouldn't say serious, but uh, not so uh, strong, maybe I should say. And you, yes, uh, you can see. Uh, uh, the rapid decline of Japanese defense budget, the upper, is the decline of, the, the, you can see the decline of Japanese defense budget and the rapid rise of Chinese defense budget. Now Chinese defense budget is four or five times bigger than Japanese defense budget. So, maybe I spent more, already 10 minutes, so I have to conclude within one or two minutes. Uh, so that's why some people started to talk that there would perhaps be a clash between the two countries. But as I said, both countries uh, really want to avoid any clash. But uh, one thing is that the Chinese community leaders couldn't fully control the hardliner military leaders within the People's Liberation Army. So that's why Chinese government didn't like to negotiate on the establishment of maritime communication mechanism or maritime security mechanisms. They try to avoid negotiations. And also, uh, they try to abandon the previous agreement between the two governments to try to uh, discuss on the border in East China Sea. Because uh, from the military point of view, it is possible and more desirable to fully control uh, the area within the first island chain. Within the first island chain, there are only three exceptions which China cannot control. Taiwan and the Senkak Islands, and some islands in the South China Sea. By controlling all of these, Taiwan and the Senkak Islands and some islands in the South China Sea, China can fully control the areas within the line of the first island chain. So that's why then again, China began to uh, launch a new uh, initiative to set the air defense identification zone. But, uh, well, responding to these more assertive Chinese foreign policy, uh, Japanese government decided to launch a new security strategy to try to respond to these challenges. 
particularly in the Abe administration. By launching a national security strategy, Japanese government clearly uh, uh, communicated to Chinese government that Japan is serious to defend Japanese own sovereign territories. That's why it becomes more difficult for Chinese government to try to threaten or try to encroach Japanese territorial areas in East China Sea. So last uh, November, as you know, Japanese Prime Minister Abe finally could meet with Chinese counterpart, uh, President Xi Jinping. And one of the reasons why they can meet is that, uh, well, President Xi Jinping now can finally have a much stronger political base. So he doesn't really have to care about criticism within the uh, Communist Party uh, that uh, well, he's very weak to China, uh, Japan. So he's strong enough to be able to negotiate with Japan and to be able to meet and talk with Japanese counterparts as Fujintao could do it in 2008. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I think we go straight to Eva. Uh, I, I just uh, uh, he might not be in the envy of the question when your brain are so much preoccupied by the brain and so on. You may, you, may have, you have to talk about East Asia. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I probably will uh, kind of link it up. Uh, you mentioned the Russia, but. Uh, Thank you for the presentation. I think before in the previous panels we discussed a lot there is a shared values and, uh, and, uh, and uh, strategic partners, but as it happens, uh, the general knowledge of the each other's agents and most probably Latvians uh, understanding or, or, or knowledge of the, of, the, of the region's complexities or, 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 or challenges is not so very known. So this, uh, this, for this reason, one only the, the seminar or symposium uh, here is, uh, is, a, is a good opportunity to learn each other. Uh, beyond that, just say that we have shared values. Uh, we, we all, you know, there is, uh, we all agree uh, and, uh, and we've all sustained, uh, we all want to sustain, you know, the international uh, walls and, and uh, international peace and, uh, and principles of the United Nations and, and we all want to uh, aim to fight uh, against the proliferation of mass discuss uh, records of mass destruction and, 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 and so on. Uh, and then something like, uh, like, 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 uh, so something like, what happened in uh, Ukraine happens, you know, the Russia uh, takes on and, and invades it and the next part of it. And suddenly, you know, all the, all the presumptions of these rules and norms uh, kind of gets under uh, quite a, a big question mark. And, and it's not just an issue then for Ukraine. And I think this presentation really clearly shows uh, norms, uh, laws, international, uh, uh, is not for nothing. I mean, they they have a really important and critical, uh, uh, you know, role to play uh, uh, in the in the way be, being set up. Uh, the international uh, world has been set up. I think that you in the introduction, or you mentioned already the the, the first issue. I mentioned the three points uh, on uh, in my introduction. The the economy. Uh, you, you highlighted very much the, 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 the high importance of the region for the global economy. And whatever happened, you know, even the small uh, disturbances would have a, a, a direct and strong impact across the world, including Latvia. Uh, but that's also, obviously, there is another direction as well. The, the economic change in the region is, I mean, it might have been before in some historical times, but but they are definitely very fast changing environment economically. It's a shifting and moving, and and, and obviously that brings on the pressure on the relationships and uh, and uh, and the interests of the nations there in the region. And uh, and uh, all we can hope and argue for that the political process or 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 or, or, or regional uh, uh, players can are able to, to develop the avenues for actually, you know, for, uh, to, to keep the pace with the economical development in the, in the region so that, you know, the uh, mutual rest, uh, respect could be maintained, sustained, that the uh, treaty of force uh, uh, could be, uh, continue to be announced and, and peaceful cooperation could be maintained. 
The other the second point, uh, obviously, is it disputes uh, in uh, uh, maritime in maritime area in the region uh, is is a critical uh, uh, is a critical risk, uh, as explained here, and uh, and uh, and uh, for us it's kind of uh, even more uh, more difficult to understand because we are this, uh, this you know we are the sea nation kind. Of live by sea, but we are uh, land and the focused uh, mines, uh, but obviously the East Asia region is a, is a, is a maritime region and, uh, and the complexity and, uh, and, uh, and the difficulty in there uh, is, is probably even uh, needs to be more uh, better understood for us. But the two items I would just link again back is uh, we have noted, uh, recorded the increased uh, uh, scrambling of jets in the, in the, in the airspace or uh, in the in in the East Asia region, uh, kind of dramatically increasing uh, uh, the, the jet scrambling to uh, identify the aircraft in the airspace uh, uh, in the region, and and the same or even higher tendencies of these happening uh, also in the Baltic Sea. The other is we recorded also the, the, the concern raised by, by Japanese Defense Minister uh, as regards the sale of Mr. Plus ships uh, to, the, to the Russia. So there again we kind of share some concerns that looking from different uh, perspectives on that. And the third last point uh, I would like to highlight on the, on the regional sense is obviously North Korea. Uh, wasn't mentioned yet much but uh, but uh, as, as we look at it, uh, it's kind of, it's not only geographically central for the East Asia, but, uh, but it's also kind of tends to uh, bind up a number of, uh, of the issues and, uh, and, uh, and would be a great prize, obviously, if there would be any, any, any movement uh, in, the, in the discussions. It's good to hear there is a renewed uh, discussions on the renewed talks of six parties talks. And, and, uh, and uh, but obviously recognize that there is a, a complicated process. But as complicated it is, the the, the gains would be equally uh, great if there could be any movement reached. Uh, and last part of concluding, I would just uh, mention uh, and underline if that wasn't already said. I think there is a great space for increased cooperation, cooperation in the security area uh, between uh, you know, uh, us and, and more particularly Japan. Uh, it, Japan, it was mentioned already, was a great contributor and is and continues to be the, the, the global stability and the prosperity. It was mentioned in the Balkans, but uh, I think equally or even higher uh, support and contribution by Japan was made to Afghanistan. And uh, I think that is uh, really highly uh, valued and recorded and, and recognized. Uh, obviously, Japan is the oldest member of, uh, how to say, a partner uh, of NATO outside uh, outside the um, Euro Atlantic area. Uh, and uh, and uh, in, in that regard, we, we, we hope and uh, we, welcome, we would welcome the, you know, Japan developing into the enhanced opportunities partner being able to advance uh, 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 you know, into more big higher roles in the peacekeeping or crisis management. And in that regard, again, we, would, uh, we are welcoming the, the increasing uh, readiness, uh, the policy of readiness to, to, uh, to play an increased role in the uh, world uh, international security for the uh, Japanese government. Uh, that would be, and the areas I would just, uh, last one, mentioned obviously the areas where we, we, we would need to be looking and thinking on, on cooperating is, is number of uh, cyber security, disaster relief, disarmament, counterterrorism obviously. It's something uh, I believe the cruelty on the ground for both of our countries uh, is or will be changing uh, the security policies in that regard. The, the cruel, cruel uh, Barbaric acts uh, executed by, by these people in the, in the, uh, in, the, in Syria and uh, maritime security and public diplomacy and I think that first and good, uh, and good sign of, of this kind of cooperation would be this uh, in a May planned uh, seminar in Tokyo on cyber security uh, together so that's, that's I think is a way to be uh, advancing and proceed. Great.
Thank you, Eva. Um, um, I think after the excellent presentation on the overview of the uh, Japan-China stuff, uh, I think we, the, uh, you know, Mr. Purins has touched up on somewhat differing sets of priorities. Uh, uh, although there are some areas where you know uh, Japan and EU uh, uh, can cooperate, like Africa, you know, uh, cyber and so on. Uh, now. Uh, with that in mind, um, how would you uh, intervene, uh, Dr. Sabatio? Uh, in the previous session, you talked about Mongol, for instance, where the EU and Japan can perhaps uh, you know, uh, cooperate. Uh, um, well, um, what, where and how we could at once start cooperation? That would be uh, the issue, please. Thank you. Yeah, I will just continue where I stopped <laughs> okay. before, uh, because uh, it's quite clear that uh, the most recent uh, incident, like, uh, the cruel murder of the Japanese sausages by Daesh, like the Paris attacks, have proven that both the EU and Japan have become a target for terrorist organizations spread from the Middle East to the African continent. We no longer live in a time where we can just feel safe because we are Europeans or Japanese. There is a global security threat to the terrorism in the moment, and our cooperation on eradicating terrorism is long-standing. We share the very same conviction with this. We have to interrupt and enhance it, and we have to take coordinated action to fight against and prevent terrorism. But in a wider field, Discussions on security are an important part of our cooperation. Anyway, with leaders exchanging views on regional and global flashpoints, just recently at the dinner between Mrs. Mogherini and uh, Foreign Minister Shida, uh, we welcome the new willingness in Tokyo under Prime Minister Abe to cooperate with the EU in the security realm, based on the one hand on a new vision for Japan's security and defense policies, and on the other, also for better understanding of the much more active role that the EU has developed over the past decade. Japan's new national security strategy contains a reference to closer cooperation with the EU. We welcome this and we would very much like to see full Japanese participation in EU-led crisis missions. I think of Atalanta, the one Africa, I think of fighting together Islamist and fundamentalistic uh, terrorism. And the framework agreement on cooperation and security in defense policy without performance abroad should not be a remote objective. We have something like this signed last year, for example, uh, with South Korea. We are both largely civilian partners, of course, but the EU is increasingly willing also to deploy military assets abroad for peace and stability. And this uh, Prime Minister Arbe's proactively contribution more to peace and stability in the world, uh, it resonates our own comprehensive approach. In fact, we are looking for concrete opportunities for cooperation in global crisis management operations, and at the same time, uh, cooperation on non-traditional security issues, such as anti-piracy, space policy, or our newly established cybersecurity dialogue with Japan. Europeans have a growing understanding of the global implications of instability in East Asia, not least as regarding maritime security. We have significant economic, political and strategic interest in the disputed maritime areas. We closely follow the development in the East and South China Sea. Just yesterday, Again, three fishing boats from the Philippines were rent by a Chinese Coast Guard vessel. As you know, we don't take a substantial position on the respective sovereignty claims and sovereignty issues in Asia, but we have a very clear and consistent position on how these issues should be addressed by the parties involved. And these correspond very closely to Prime Minister's Harvest's three principles as outlined at the last year's Shangri-La. First, we urge all parties concerned to clarify the basis of their claims and to seek peaceful and cooperative solutions 
in accordance with international law, in particular the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea, and we encourage uh, the acceleration of work on the China ASEAN Code of Conduct. Second, all parties should refrain from unilateral action, which could cause further frictions, and in particular from using force or coercion. We are thus concerned by the construction activities ongoing on various islets and rocks aimed at turning them into islands in the sense of the UNCLOS. Ladies and gentlemen, in no way the islands can be compared with West Berlin or turned into the West Berlin. This is, I think, a comparison which uh, should be rejected from the beginning. We strongly believe, this is my third point, that the establishment of emergency communication lines, including among the military and trust building members, are vital. We welcome very much, therefore, the resumption last month of talks between Japan and China following the understanding at APEC in November uh, on maritime crisis management mechanism. And our experience shows that disputes can be settled within a legal framework and the EU is committed to work towards the strengthening of the law-based global and regional order. And again, we think that a Helsinki process for East Asia would not be the first. And in this uh, context, we welcome, of course, the North Asia Peace Initiative, also of the Korean President, uh, Mrs. Park. Based on our experiences, we also encourage joint management of resources. Separating the sovereignty issue from economic exploitation and the conclusion of joint development agreements, as advocated by the United Nations, which encourage the provision of agreements of a practical nature without prejudging the final limitation of maritime boundaries can contribute to much needed confidence building. We organized a seminar on this with ASEAN and another one uh, with in Malaysia is under preparation. Let me conclude. The EU is a stakeholder in the security in Asia. More trade these days happens between the EU and East Asia than between the EU and North America. We maintain close relations with the region on the bilateral and multilateral level. Another example here is the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. We have just this week renewed our sanctions. We still try to remain engaged in the critical dialogue. And uh, it's a matter of human security in a broader, in a broader sense that we have just uh, Japan and the EU together undertaken an initiative on the human rights issue in North Korea, which led to a UN resolution. And we have yesterday delivered a joint demarche in Pyongyang against the restriction of uh, diplomats. Uh, Pyongyang has uh, uh, for more than two months now uh, used there. Our membership in the Asian Region Forum of course, the EU membership in the G7. Our aspiration to become a member of the East Asia Summit. And our record also in CSDP deployments some years ago in Mindanao and in Aceh show really that our non confrontational, crisis prevention oriented, soft power inspired, comprehensive approach to foreign and security policy makes the EU an interesting partner also for Asian countries to ease tensions in the region. Thank you for your attention. Great. Uh, okay. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, it's uh, sort of a welcome reassurance uh, of the EU's positive and concrete involvement uh, in Eastern Asia, uh, including uh, the sort of principled uh, sort of treatment of the disputes there, uh, which must be peaceful uh, and the uh, sort of non-unilateral uh, manner. Now, um, we may come back to this point uh, later on, but uh, the, uh, uh, we should ask um, Professor uh, Zanetta uh, Ozolina uh, to continue this discussion. Would you like to talk? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for organizers uh, bringing together 
so interesting speakers, uh, we could discuss, discuss openly a uh, wide range of issues. Uh, I would like to start uh, with a short remark, but moderator said in the beginning that you have three things in mind. Uh, sorry, I have so many things in mind, but seven minutes, <laughs> it's uh, uh, even less, uh, it's, it's uh, too short time to express all of them. So therefore, I decided probably to divide my short presentation in two parts. Uh, first part, I will try to focus on the basic principles uh, which uh, the European Union uh, and Latvia is part of the European Union and also Japan shares. And then I will go forward with some possible platforms for cooperation. And uh, of course, I acknowledge that there are enough differences between uh, the EU and uh, Japan and also China, which is an important uh, member of, of uh, East and Asia. Uh, but I would like to focus more on what brings us together and what is really not only our shared values, but our shared responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis international security. So when it comes to uh, basic principles which we share, and I think that during the day many of them have been mentioned already, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's security which is uh, very deeply anchored in international law, norms and rules. Uh, this is respect to uh, different procedures which have been uh, developed by international organizations. Uh, multilateralism is part of our daily business. Uh, understanding of security in uh, both regions are based on comprehensive and cooperative approach, which is far away and much wider than classically political and military security. Uh, besides, uh, both uh, actors are very much uh, uh, developing their security policies based on partnership principles. And today we already mentioned several important partners, not only international organizations, but also like the United States and many other countries which are part of international security landscape. So, we can agree on principles. So the next question, of course, then is uh, what we can do together and where is uh, so-called shared expertise of the European Union, Latvia, the presidency as a moment, and also Japan. And there are different areas which I uh, am, am eager to mention, but again, I'm restricted in time, therefore I go more like telegraphic way. Uh, I think that one of very important uh, platforms for our cooperation still lies uh, in the framework of international organizations. And uh, um, Today we have heard uh, already different examples where the European Union and Japan is cooperating together, like anti piracy, um, like other missions. But I also wanted to mention expertise which Japan developed uh, uh, participating in post reconstruction activities in different parts of the world. And looking at the most recent years in Afghanistan, then within the UNAMA mission, uh, Japan was one of the biggest financial contributors to stability in this country. Uh, and very many EU member states were also contributing to this mission. And if these days we are uh, looking at TV and not following so much of violence, but mostly receiving positive messages uh, from Afghanistan, its contribution uh, from Japan, Japanese side and also from EU side. Uh, another important uh, platform for cooperation which I would like to mention, uh, it's related to um, security development goals because 2015 is the year uh, when the United Nations is going to redefine its uh, development goals. Uh, and uh, Japan and also Latvia has invested quite a lot in uh, such concept as human security. And Japan was a country which uh, from the very early 90s uh, was putting this concept not only as one of important benchmarks on international arena, but it was the core of Japanese foreign policy. Uh, Latvia in that respect puts human security very much at the core of its national policy and national development plan. But still, uh, this is the knowledge and expertise uh, which both sides can share internationally, also sub-regionally and also nationally. And also during the first part of the day, one of our speakers, uh, sorry if uh, I am not able to recall, who was that, 
mentioned that Japan recently also raised very really highly uh, as a priority of the country uh, gender equality. Uh, and more recently, uh, on UN level, the discussion about engendering uh, human security is becoming more and more topical, where both countries can also contribute um, to that very important issue. Uh, and uh, again, coming back to uh, Sustainable Development Goals of 2015, uh, the most recent discourse demonstrates that uh, SDGs are very much economized and nobody would undermine the role of economy in development. At the same time, uh, very many important human security related points which were part of Millennium Goals are lost somewhere in translation. Uh, probably again, this is one of the fields where the EU and, and Japan could also contribute to that particular uh, issue. Uh, another important point is such field as security and development of course is very closely related to SDGs, uh, but more and more the international security field cannot be divided in a narrow uh, shelves or a narrow sector, sectors. So security and development goes hand in hand. It's uh, also, if we are looking at uh, spread of violence, uh, human trafficking and very many other issues, so they are very deeply rooted into security and, uh, and development fabric. Uh, and final point which I wanted to mention is that uh, Japan is one of the examples uh, of the country and also society which is able uh, to be very innovative in managing uh, disaster uh, issues. So disaster management is one of very high expertise which uh, Japan developed over decades. And if we are looking at uh, different consequences caused by climate change and also by unfortunate mismanagement of uh, human beings, then uh, expertise of Japan could be of great value to international community. So, and coming to an end, I would like to say that despite differences, uh, Japan and the European Union and Latvia has much more in common or to share and the international security agenda is expanding and growing day by day and hour by hour. So we don't have too much time to discuss, probably it's time to add. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed also to keep the time uh, so aware. Now, um, I think we have, um, say, 15 minutes to, to discuss, uh, including the uh, before uh, war. No, but before uh, passing the, um, the floor to, uh, you know, to the floor, um, I, well, let me say in this way, um, I still have sort of, um, you know, we say in Japanese, sort of scratching uh, the, the itchy foot uh, from above the, uh, the shoes. You know, uh, you know we, we understand, we have a shared minds, you know, the uh, human rights, the rule of law, democracy, develop, development, uh, freedom of navigation, you know, disaster you know, management and so on. But I you know, just, just um, wonder if we translate all of this into the concrete project in East Asia, what, what would be the result? The, um, the, for instance, the freedom of navigation, um, the EU has uh, you know, uh, quite a you know, uh, remarkable set of resources, but you know, uh, it, it may be overstretched. You know, if we you know, uh, translate these sort of things uh, into the concrete action there, um, the, um, given the poor initiation uh, of human rights, uh, both in you know, uh, um, China as well as in course, the North uh, Korea, what would be the you know concrete uh, you know joint actions that you would propose? I just just wonder uh, um, either of three of you the European uh, the, the uh, speakers would respond, and perhaps the Jose from might follow up uh, with some other questions. Would you like to, to add something? Uh, no. So is, is there somebody who can perhaps? Uh, Respond. No. I can. So I was the one who was invited for action, so I can propose at least uh, 
two concrete proposals, what both sides could do. I think one would be very important uh, related uh, to SDGs. And the uh, central discussion is still open and ongoing. Uh, probably uh, with joint efforts we could a little bit slightly, I would say, to change uh, this course from weaponization to humanization of SDGs. And uh, besides, it looks at the present moment uh, as the upper hand is taken by uh, those advocates of SDGs who would like to bring a discourse in the direction uh, of uh, full responsibility on the shoulders of uh, private business and civil society. Uh, but SDGs cannot be implemented without uh, assistance of the state. So <laughs> myself, I'm always uh, debating and being advocate of minimizing uh, the role of the state. But on international arena, you cannot proceed only with private business and uh, NGOs. So uh, harmless or balanced uh, involvement of all actors is very relevant. And the second proposal would be uh, not shared values, but shared knowledge with regard to disaster management. Right. Mm -hmm. well, this is uh, sort of, uh, I think, potentially very fruitful territory to explore. Um, anything else? If not, I would just not mention that uh, it would be too ambitious for Latvia right away to, uh, to be coming forward with any concrete and uh, action items. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, I, uh, and that's why I was looking at my colleague but, uh, uh, on a, what's, what's on the EU area. But, but uh, on, the, on the practical level, as I mentioned, I think that, 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 that we have to be developing, in a sense, uh, better understanding and knowledge of the region to be able uh, actually to be uh, a meaningful uh, role in that. And as I mentioned, uh, ex-seminars uh, like this and then uh, on the cyber security and then kind of uh, looking at the, as, as, as we from Riga uh, look uh, uh, from the resources we have and, 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 and the experience and expertise that we kind of uh, build build on, on us piece by piece and, 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 and see how can we be contributing uh, to each other's uh, security and uh, find the ways, uh, find the areas we can you know, cooperate more. But on a broader area, it's obviously a multi multilateral approach or, 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 or projects uh, that would have to be uh, looked at and considered. Great. Uh, thank sure. you. Uh, just, just, just to uh, strengthen the point I made on our time security, I mean, this is an obvious issue regarding the green navigation. You know, we had last year uh, in spring. Uh, uh, joined another exercise at the Home of Africa, which is China. And uh, there had been an uh, exercise uh, not coordinated, but in parallel to ours, we took note of Taiwan, because we have no cooperation in this regard with Taiwan, but nevertheless, uh, another exercise took place. So uh, this is a very concrete uh, issue where uh, Joint another exercise uh, with Japan before we enter the contractual relationship on the CFTP framework agreement that could be undertaken to look the momentum. Uh, it applies to any other of our uh, CSD deployments, uh, particularly in Africa, in the same way. But uh, this would be something where one could uh, go from talking to it. Right. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think we should open the floor. And if there is anybody who can make a question, well, there are four. Uh, one, two, three, or maybe first, please. Okay. Uh, Sigma Akrava, the University of Latvia professor. I have two questions to Dr. Ento and to Dr. Hosoya. The first question we know that Japan has extremely developed know how and technologies concerning maritime safety. I wonder if you would be ready to share this knowledge and technologies with EU, because we all know about the safety issues we had in the Baltic Sea 
uh, last year. The second question. Uh, do you regard India as a third growing probably elephant in Asia? And do you regard India as a reliable part, uh, partner on safety issues, on security matters? Thank you. Thank you. Um, gentlemen uh, in front and later. Well, I myself before. I would like to know what are public methods. The best military methods is a very cautious political state of public methods. And secondly, why does China all of a sudden, after many years of obvious cooperation with, with your country now, flex its uh, muscles? Is it political, politically motivated, or are there economic reasons? Is there oil, gas, mangan, or whatever under the South China Sea? So, so what was the first, first, what was the first point? Order of water. Ah, okay. Oh, no, no, it's okay. You said the introduction, sir. Um, gentlemen. Uh, Richard Van Maas, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, dealing with CSDP issues here. Uh, basically, I have two questions. One question I'd like to ask to our Japanese distinguished guests uh, about uh, uh, the role of uh, human security in future, future role of human security in Japanese foreign policy uh, in, in light of these recent uh, interpretation changes to our constitution that allows a greater use of uh, uh, military outside Japan's territory. And the second question is uh, to our director for Northeast Asia and Pacific from External Action Service. Uh, if you had to write in one or two sentences for a new strategy of European Union for foreign affairs or security policy, uh, the role of Japan in the next uh, five to ten years, what would that be? Thank you. Briefly, please. Uh, very, very briefly, also my response. Uh, maybe a comment, a little bit of an unfair comment and question to Dr. Sabatier, because well, it's unfair, and we'll know why. When you say, in the sense that the, um, the, the, the EU adheres to international laws, international norms as regards you know maritime, maritime um, territorial rights, and so on, it's all very true. It's all, it all sounds good, and it's true. It's, that's what the EU should, should be doing. The problem, of course, is that uh, here it becomes controversial that at least one participant of this concert of, 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 of disputes, China, uh, does not care at all about the national norms and rules of, of, of maritime law. China is making, this, is making this every day very clear that uh, it, it listens to others saying that, that, that others adhere to international laws and the sea of law, while, while its actions you know, it's making it very clear that China does not really care about others' opinions about China's territorial rights and their and so on rights in the territory. So, in, in that, in that, the consequence would then be to to, to continue uh, repeating that that the EU uh, adheres to international law, or tell um, or, or speak to China in a, in a different mode, saying, look, you know, we, we have a position. Why don't we develop a position? Why don't we use our expertise to to um, help others or the region to, the region to, to define where these territories uh, belong to because they are methods and they're instruments. It's not, you know, it's not uh, always nuclear physics, it's, it's doable. And then take a, take a position, full stop. Why, why is the EU, in that case, and here at the so timid? Right. Uh, so for those who have a question, perhaps two minutes. No, for those not, maybe one minute. So we'll say some two minutes. Thank you very much. Um, Responding to a couple of questions about the Japanese role, particularly in the beginning, maritime, secu in maritime security. Uh, well, last month I visited Indonesia to meet with some officials and uh, researchers, and then the last week I joined an in international symposium in Tokyo on maritime security with other Asian countries, participants from Southeast Asian countries and ASEAN and uh, China as well. And a uh, majority of uh, ASEAN people, countries, governments, strongly uh, wants Japan to play a larger role in uh, South China Sea. And 
I think that the Japanese government has been more or less reluctant to do that because the Chinese government doesn't like to see it. And the Sino-Japanese relations, cooperation is important. But ASEAN countries demand larger Japanese role. And recently, a few days ago, American commander also said that Japan should undertake a patrolling mission in South China Sea, but I don't think it is possible. Well, what the Japanese government is doing is capacity building. I mean, to try to help to build uh, coast guard capacities of ASEAN countries. And I think that Japan can do it in Europe or Central Asia, some other countries. No, of course, Central Asia countries, they don't have to have a coast guard. They don't have a coast. So, uh, well, we can help them in some way uh, from a technological point of view. And uh, this is my answer to the question. And India, India can be a reliable partner, but India also prefer independence and doesn't like to stick to any one camp. So for India, both Japan, United States, China, all of these countries are vitally important. So they, I mean that India cannot take part in any one camp, always try to be independent. And the uh, role of human security, this is very important because Japanese security role has been largely limited to uh, humanitarian and uh, civilian operations. So that's why Japanese human security mission are uh, slightly different from the EU mission of human security. And particularly, Japanese government has been focusing on ODA I and mean, the economic assistance and humanitarian assistance and the civilian missions. But slowly, under the Prime Minister Abe, Japanese government tried to expand a little to help others in human security missions. Uh, so that's why it is more probable and possible for Japanese government to join in international cooperation and international coalition to do this kind of human security mission. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do you have anything to comment on the final? No? If not, it's fine. <laughs> try to combine the answer to the two questions I was asked and I like to do it uh, in a constructive way, telling you that uh, we are on the eve now of the EU updating, in fact, elaborating a new foreign policy strategy. You know that our security strategy stems from 2003, the world has changed, it will be between one of the first priorities you are presented advice to then uh, to assess and then draw the necessary conclusions in a new wide strategy. And to be honest, the challenge is uh, perhaps bigger than 2003 uh, because we uh, went through an important uh, phase in the last 10 years also where we have to be realistic in so far as our geopolitical capacity is uh, concerned. Uh, there are still tools in the Lisbon Treaty on security defense policy which have not been uh, fully used. This is a challenge per se. We would need, not need a new strategy to do this, but we would just need to act in uh, the topic. But our geopolitical capacity is uh, restrained by two factors. I would not call it timid, but I would call it uh, realistic. First is the capacity to act and to agree in unity. Uh, with 28 member countries, this is not always easy. Always offering some of them also, uh, on, of the member countries, uh, offer privileged uh, access and relations to one or other of the bigger powers, uh, what uh, the US uh, has done, been done, what Russia is doing, China tries to do as well. Uh, we have now one member country uh, which has a declared policy of opening up to the East, uh, even in some illiberal uh, democratic uh, way. Uh, this country will be uh, visited in two weeks' time by President Putin. 
and uh, we hope, of course, that we will succeed uh, better in these very important talks today in Moscow by the two uh, heads of uh, state government from France and uh, Germany, uh, not to uh, yeah, remain on a level of acting with regard to the Ukraine crisis, which is uh, still below of solving it. And the second matter is uh, our geographical capacity. Quite clearly, we discussed before, uh, our neighborhood policy was designed to create a ring of friends. And some academic authors now uh, have turned this, declaring this is a ring of fire, which has resulted within 10 years from Libya to Ukraine. And therefore, as I said in the morning, we need an overhaul of our neighborhood policy, not only in the Eastern, but also in the Mediterranean. And in so far, uh, I promise you that we will have uh, answers, uh, but still uh, in a couple of uh, months, perhaps end of the year only, when we see how uh, fast we can move on the uh, security uh, and foreign policy strategy to be uh, renewed. What is clear from my point of view is that uh, it must have a global perspective. It must uh, uh, put uh, the terrorist uh, danger in the same focus as it's in danger of the changed policies of uh, uh, some of our neighbors in the East. Uh, so this twofold uh, challenge is in fact uh, also keeping up somehow our urgency in looking beyond this neighborhood, looking beyond uh, the geographical scope of our capacities, I mean, to East Asia and uh, the Far East. Therefore, we have uh, a clear policy of engagement with China to uh, try to uh, make China, your neighbor, a more responsible partner of the international oil to uh, avoid uh, undermining undermining of this international order uh, by an emerging uh, strong power and uh, also take close attention of other tools and instruments uh, China is uh, have started to take uh, for example in the maritime field. You know the policy of China of a maritime silk road. A wonderful uh, idea. Of course, uh, this com in contact in with uh, the capacity of, for financial diplomacy to uh, buy uh, important harbors and ports from Sri Lanka to Peru Athens makes it also a tool of uh, geopolitics. And so far, we have to, to think about how we engage also in, in this regard. So, Security is a very broad it's human security, but also a matter of infrastructure, uh, security of hard power challenges and all, which we have all to take up in our new foreign policy. Again, uh, applying all the tools, uh, comprehensive approach uh, we have in mind, but one precondition is, of course, for this, that there is a united voice of the 28. Sorry that I've been a bit long in this uh, regard, but this uh, is, I think, the, the full answer of what you have uh, just yeah. asked. Because, okay. All right. Um, any winding up? Fine. So I, I would like to happily conclude this session by thanking all of the speakers. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the chair, I should say, the time resources of the symposium are totally exhausted. So, according to program, I should provide some conclusions. I will be very, very, very concise. So, the symposium confirms the essence of the EU-Japan relations, which in turn is a uh, axiomatic basis platform for the Latvian presidency in the Council of uh, European Union when we take a look at, at EU-Japan uh, relations. To sum up, I, what I mean is 
And what is confirmed by this symposium is Japan is a natural partner for the European Union. We are democracies, we share common values and interests, we are willing to contribute to international peace and stability. We believe in rules-based effective multilateralism to respond to global challenges. We share a strong interest in peace, stability and prosperity in our respective regions and the world at, world at large and are committed to the peaceful resolution of disputes. Given our combined global economic weight in international standing, we have a common interest and responsibility to show joint leadership on these issues. So, when finalizing, Ladies and gentlemen, thank you to all of you for the participation in the symposium. Thank you very much to the distinguished speakers and moderators. Special gratitude goes to the organizers and main ministries of foreign affairs of Japan and Latvia, to the supporters, European External Action Service. In particular, I would like to express the gratitude to two very energetic and outstanding diplomats who worked very hard to organize this particular seminar. I mean Mr. Michishuge Mori from the Embassy of Japan in Riga and to Mr. Oleg Olros from the MFA, uh, MFA of Latvia, please. Thank you so much. Now, I would like to say again thank you and invite you to the lunch, it will be